everyone. Uh, welcome to the Oxford Martin School. Uh, my name is Charles Goffrey. I'm the director. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome the first of a series of talks we're having this term on things around food, the many different aspects of the global food uh, system. And it's a particular pleasure to introduce an old friend of mine, Michael Obersteiner, who's going to be giving the talk this afternoon. And you can see the title there. And it's a pleasure for all sorts of reasons. One is that um, Miko, who's had a very distinguishing, distinguished career, most recently as Program Director of the Ecosystem Services and Management Program at EASA in Luxembourg in Australia, where he's really led on systems approaches to many issues, including food, has just moved to Oxford as the new head of the Environmental Change Institute. And I think this is your first formal talk at Oxford uh, outside your department. Um, Mikhail, as I said, has had an extraordinary distinguished career, has published on, on a, an enormous range of different topics, and is very influential outside academia. For example, he serves on UNEP's International Resource Panel um, and has been involved in ITBES, many, uh, several chapters in, in ITBES, and as a steering member of UNISDR, which I probably can't remember exactly what that acronym is, Global Assessment Report. So, Mikhail, Please come and give us your talk. Thank you, Charles. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's really a deep honor and a big pleasure to actually be here in Oxford. Uh, this is my new home now. And uh, I think uh, up to now, I was really very well received. Uh, and it's a super vibrant uh, atmosphere. And I'm sure it will be continued. And uh, uh, maybe I can even spike it a little more. And you will, I will try to do my best uh, now even. So uh, I choose this title, uh, Sustainability Scenarios for the Global Food and Land Use System. And to many people, scenarios is this. So where you basically, you do something, and then a miracle happens, and then you have the output. And it's actually when uh, we invented uh, uh, BEX, which is uh, kind of the dominating uh, negative emission technology currently in the, in the IPCC scenarios, and I will actually go into it, uh, we submitted it to Nature. And then I got a phone call from someone I didn't know, and he said, what is this? This is, this is only scenario analysis. Uh, this is not serious uh, work. This is no evidence. And uh, then we basically, I gave up and uh, we published it somewhere else. Uh, and, uh, and so I thought I'm not doing really serious work. And uh, maybe after this one now, uh, you have a little more, bit more patience with me. <laughs> And uh, in our work, because you know, making uh, a science out of the future is not an easy thing. Um, so, what I would like to talk about is uh, uh, scenarios and what role they played for the formulation of a few science-based targets. Uh, you know, the planetary boundaries, but uh, uh, this is actually a broader field. Uh, then I, I would like to give you some work we did recently with the Food and Land Use Coalition on multi-sector transitions in the food uh, and land use uh, space. And then uh, something we just recently uh, published uh, is uh, the idea of a senaton. So now I can get my Wikipedia entry on, uh, on a, a word which we just created. Uh, uh, didn't do that yet, uh, but uh, we'll definitely do it. So that's a scenario senaton or hackathon. Um, where we play actually with countries. And then uh, at the very end, I would like to talk a little bit about algorithmic policy making and crowd senatons, really kind of downscaling it to the individuals and uh, probably enter a little bit of a uh, controversial uh, discussion on this because this is, uh, there are quite a few ethical uh, issues associated with it. Okay. Um, before I really dive into the details of, uh, of scenarios, uh, here in, in the, uh, in the IPBES, I'm an old IPBES guy, so I always pronounce it a little different, uh, we came up with this scheme where we associate scenarios with the policy cycle. And uh, what you see here is uh, on the policy cycle, the agenda setting, uh, where you actually use exploratory scenarios. 
Uh, then in the design phase, you actually go for uh, target seeking scenarios and you look at the pathways on how to get to a particular uh, target, so let's say a climate target. And then uh, what you do is uh, you do policy screening scenarios. Uh, I'm not super happy with uh, this term, but that's what we agreed upon, uh, where you basically model out policy instruments. Uh, a subsidy, a ban of uh, a certain behavior, uh, and so on, and then see how this, uh, uh, this particular policy or a bundle of policies uh, actually get you to a certain target. And then, then in the end, you have monitoring and evaluation. Um, uh, we, at my previous institute uh, at YASA, International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, we were involved in quite a few scenario exercises which really informed the, the, the formulation of science-based uh, targets. So uh, I want to mention here, and I will actually go into details on the first one. So when I started my career, uh, 400 ppmv in the atmosphere was kind of coined as the safe target the, the, the world should, uh, should go for. So this is well above uh, 3 degrees uh, temperature. Um, and then uh, we basically invented our bags and we showed more is possible. And, uh, and nowadays we are talking about something many people think uh, and consider infeasible is actually the 1.5 degree scenario. So here really uh, the, 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 the scenario community uh, informed the policy process that more is possible and the policy process really followed up. Um, what we also did, this was together with uh, WWF in, uh, in the year 2010, 2011, uh, where we uh, really were investigating how can we formulate a target for avoided deforestation. And, uh, and what we came up wa with was uh, a zero net uh, target formulation, which actually now is even a, an SDG, under SDG 15. Um, what we are currently doing, and I will show a few slides on this, is uh, uh, there's a huge discussion currently ongoing. What's the target for the CBD? What's the biodiversity target uh, the, the world should uh, shoot for? And here we do a very similar exercise where we uh, uh, kind of equivalent to a temperature target, uh, see how far, how ambitious can we actually go? by transforming actually the, the, the food sector mostly. And then uh, uh, this is the new acronym of the UN ISDR charts. So it's uh, UNDRR, <laughs> uh, disaster risk reduction. Uh, and here we just start, a uh, not an, even a negotiation, just a discussion of whether we would be able to formulate a systemic risk target uh, for global society in the context of, uh, of disaster risks. Uh, however, here we, we just start uh, with uh, uh, more discussion rather than real quantification. But that's definitely also something that's, uh, that's on the horizon. So uh, let me get into, into the nitty-gritty details uh, and some of the uh, undesirable uh, aspects of the scenarios uh, the community, the scenario community created. So this is a paper that just uh, appeared uh, three days ago. And what it shows is, uh, it shows you the, 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 uh, the scenario bundles that are consistent with the two degree and the 1.5 degree scenario. And what you see here is that uh, we really go in free fall reduction of, uh, of uh, fossil fuel emissions. And then even in 2040, or even before 2040, but most of the density of the scenarios are actually around 2050, we go, we go negative. And, uh, uh, and then afterwards, we actually go negative quite dramatically. And, uh, uh, and I will, I will elaborate on this a little more. However, the, the bad news is, is that uh, uh, this is what the pledges say. This is what the countries that went to Paris and said, here are our ambitious uh, 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 pledges to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but they are absolutely not in sync yet with uh, what actually we, is needed uh, for the uh, 1.5 or 2 degree scenario. So there's a huge, it's called uh, ambition gap between the two. 
And uh, when we look at the, the land use sector, uh, the picture is this. So here you have uh, what the, con the countries expect their emissions will be from the land use sector. And this is what at that time the intended national contribution was saying. Uh, however, you could equally say that this is uh, technically we call this hot air, so these are kind of uh, overstated uh, 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 emissions uh, because uh, there is an incentive to overstate your baseline emissions because you might get credited for this difference here. So, so there, are, there are incentives for countries to, to do these kind of uh, red, uh, uh, red scenarios. And uh, this is what countries really should do in order to go to the 1.5 uh, degree scenarios. So here, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, something which is quite alarming, actually, how little we're actually progressing on uh, the international negotiations based on the contributions from individual countries. Um, but let me come back to the, to the uh, slide which I showed before. So this is kind of the optimal control schedule of negative emissions. So what you see here is uh, you, you, you don't do too much and you do most of the, you undo most of the emissions you did, uh, we're doing now in the last 20 years. And, uh, uh, and then you hit the two degree target. However, there's very little thinking uh, of what happens afterwards. And what the climate modelers are doing, they basically look at the, the year 2101, and then they say, okay, uh, uh, we just balance the non-CO2 greenhouse gases, uh, and, uh, and then we just continue out. Uh, however, this is, uh, to everyone on the street, this would be a completely nonsensical strategy to do so. Uh, so here, there's a lot of work st still to be done. And, uh, when you, when you look at uh, the uh, masses of uh, uh, emission scenarios, here you have the different models, here you have the different uh, baseline conditions, so to say, and here you have different targets. Uh, and this is the, the, the pathways of the negative emissions. And you actually see there's full agreement that we should undo this, the, this, the emissions, the fossil fuel emissions, which we are uh, uh, emitting today, just in the, in the very last, uh, at the very last minute. Hmm? And uh, uh, when you look at, uh, and we looked at the financial implications of this, so we basically performed the financial stress test of this strategy. So basically, uh, you go to 2050, then, uh, and then afterwards you do negative emissions. And here what you see is, this is the zero line, uh, and here you have uh, an expected 2% of GDP that is necessary in 2080 in order to just pay for, for uh, the negative emissions. However, you actually see it could even go down to this is 10% uh, of GDP. And uh, it's, it's percent in the sense of uh, in 2080, we will be six times richer than today. So this is a lot of money which we would have to spend uh, at that time. And 10% of GDP, this is health budget and uh, education budget together of a typical OECD country. So uh, uh, this is quite serious uh, and not very well thought out. However, we can get lucky and we get uh, negative emissions for much cheaper. Then, uh, uh, then uh, this is not so much of a problem. Uh, however, in all of these, uh, these scenarios, we assume that everyone on Earth pays. If you uh, establish a rule, which is called the Brazilian proposal, where countries pay according to the historical contribution of, uh, of emissions, uh, then uh, a country like uh, the UK would spend its entire governmental budget uh, basically our pensions, our uh, healthcare costs, and so forth, just for negative emissions, if we get unlucky. And uh, uh, there's a small little note, in all of these scenarios, uh, there's steady economic growth. So if all in a sudden we get a financial uh, uh, meltdown, or we might actually start some new wars or so and destroy uh, a lot of our capital and, and growth potential, then uh, we could actually not repair the, the, the atmosphere anymore or the climate system. So this is uh, a, a rather risky strategy to postpone uh, the, the restoration of the atmosphere, I call it, uh, to the last 20 years. 
Um, <clears throat> so what, uh, what we propose is basically it, here, this is uh, the, the, the current mainstream thinking on how to do the, the scheduling of negative emissions and uh, the, uh, uh, the emission reduction scheduling. There is uh, one scenario, this is called the LED scenario, we'll come back to that later. Uh, this is really you try not to incur, not to do any of these negative emission technologies. Uh, and you do re very rapid decarbonization. What you can also do is you can start very early with the negative emissions and ramp them down uh, uh, later on, such that you get to zero net quite early. And with the benefit that you don't get a, a uh, carbon dioxide and temperature overshoot, uh, uh, and you might not disturb the the climate system too much. Or you just smooth it over time, which I call uh, minimize CDR. So there are, there are different ways uh, to, to do that. Um, <clears throat> to shock you even more, uh, in most of these scenarios, we did not calculate in climate feedbacks. Uh, and here, one example is permafrost. And uh, additional emissions due to permafrost thawing, uh, which you would have to uh, counteract with negative emissions in, in addition. And uh, what we calculated in this paper in, in 2018 was uh, uh, the reduction, and this is called, uh, shown here, the reduction in the remaining carbon budget. So this is the additional amount of carbon we can still put into, into the atmosphere and still be compliant with uh, a 1.5 degree scenario. However, if we now take into account the permafrost uh, uh, feedbacks that might be associated also with a 1.5 degree scenario, uh, uh, which is an ambitious one, the, the remaining carbon budget might actually be gone already. So here you see the zero line. And we calculated that it's about 5% of uh, probability that uh, the carbon budget is gone today. So this would mean we have to stop fossil fuel emissions today and uh, see that we can actually ramp up uh, negative emission technologies. And 5% is not a small number. Just think about the 5% risk of anything. And, um, uh, and now we have got really interested in, in, in this. Uh, this is uh, yet unpublished, but I really find this uh, very uh, insightful. Or well, at least this is uh, the fun of a modeler, let's put it that way. So what we did is uh, we, we run a mitigation pathway out to 2100 with uh, the goal to preserve 30% of the permafrost. And here is the emission pathway associated uh, with this target of a permafrost. And, uh, and it's, it's really interesting. So you have here free fall uh, emission reductions. You go negative quite early on. And then for about 150 years, you, you go into a deep, deep of, of negative emissions afterwards. Huh? Because what you have to do, so to say, you have to refreeze the Earth in order to freeze the permafrost that it actually, actually stays. And, uh, and so uh, if you kind of uh, think about a little blip, which we are doing now in terms of overshooting and which we might trigger permafrost uh, 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 thawing, uh, we will regret this for at least for 150 years. And here the assumption is that this is actually reversible. And this is also a, a debate whether or not uh, once you trigger a thawing of a permafrost, whether you can actually refreeze it properly because of microbial activity and other things. So uh, uh, here, this is uh, something really a plea to think longer term and not only formulate uh, targets out to 2100. OK, um, so that's exactly what this slide uh, shows. Uh, really go for, for the long term and also think uh, more for intergenerational uh, planning. Um, and especially when you look at uh, the land use sector, which is one of the hopeful uh, negative emission technologies through nature-based solutions, uh, I show you here a, uh, a, uh, a map a cataster map uh, from Austria uh, from the year 1823. And uh, uh, this is basically 200 years later. So what it tells you is everything you determine to, uh, 
we, we determined in this country 200 years ago, uh, most of the elements actually stay. So there's a lot of memory. If, so if we go for nature-based solutions, we will see the, the effect of it uh, in, the, in, the, in the very long run. And uh, so here you have the forests, uh, here you have the, the houses of the farmers with the livestock, and this is where the fields are. And unfortunately, in this case, uh, we had urban sprawl. But it's just fascinating how, uh, what kind of path dependency you see over time uh, uh, when, you, when you do certain things uh, in, in landscapes. Um, so just to conclude on, on this bit uh, of the talk is, uh, uh, I think we really need to think long term. Uh, we need to do financial stress testing of the, the scenarios which we are creating because we might run into financial infeasibilities of uh, what, what we propose. Um, there is, especially on negative emission technologies, uh, technical, technical readiness level, uh, we have quite some uncertainties whether these technologies will really deliver. And then on the demand side, so to say, like with the case of the permafrost, but there are other tipping points uh, in, the, in the Earth system where you could expect some, some feedbacks. Uh, we need to hedge these kind of risks and we need to prepare for them today. And this was also the original idea of, uh, of, uh, of uh, BEX uh, as a uh, technology to actually hedge risks. However, we in the, in the integrated assessment community decided to make it a regular technology that brings us to 1.5 rather than just being a risk hedging technology, which was a mistake, I would say. Um, and, uh, and then there are, and we will go a little bit into it, that there are uh, environmental and also social trade-offs, uh, which we will have to consider. And uh, there are path dependency, just link, think about the Cadastre map, which I showed to you. And what we really didn't discuss too much, there are huge intergenerational equity issues. So my grandchild, she will actually pay for many of these uh, negative emissions and probably uh, go to uh, a less endowed uh, university because uh, we will have to, to invest quite a lot into restoring the atmosphere, so to say. Uh, so my conclusion on this one is we, we really need a, a new set of scenarios and we really need to go very long term and really think about uh, uh, the long term consequences. And uh, we also, I think, just having a temperature target as we have it today is probably not sufficient. We really have to go towards uh, uh, more informed and more tangible targets like a permafrost target, which really tells you more about the functioning uh, of the Earth system overall. Uh, and uh, we are doing uh, first steps in, in, in this direction. Okay, uh, let me now go into the co-production of uh, multi-sector uh, uh, transitions. Uh, this is something we did uh, within the uh, food and land use uh, coalition. And uh, we just published now in September a report uh, which is called uh, Growing Better. And it's uh, quite important to mention that this is, this is a, a consultation report. Hmm? So this is just the outcome of a consultation. This is not something you know, you, you, where, where you do very authoritative uh, research, although I think we ended up also doing that one. Um, just very, very shortly, this is a rather new initiative, mostly from people coming out of the energy sector who I think think that the energy problem is largely solved. The land use problem is really the big elephant in the room where we still have to do a lot of work. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, self-governed. Uh, it's a rather influential uh, uh, network, both in terms of linkages to businesses, uh, governments, but also to the uh, NGO world. Um, and it has global coverage with uh, deep dives into, into uh, a few countries. And the overall mantra is that we should work uh, as much as possible with evidence. Um, what we ended up uh, doing was uh, uh, commission a few 
deeper dive papers, uh, just sketching out some of the most important issues uh, uh, that are associated with the transition of the, of the land use sector. And uh, in a, in a uh, telecom, uh, the, the problem came up, uh, how do we actually communicate in a consistent manner? And uh, then me as the little, little modeler, I raised my, my, my voice and said, you know, modeling, this is really what uh, quantification, this is a way to have a conversation in order to come up uh, with a consistent story. And also it's an elegant way to, to battle out certain controversies because in the end you need to agree on a number. And so, so we used uh, really the modeling quite extensively uh, as a communication tool and to organize the overall consultation process. Um, so this pyramid is the, is, uh, is the visualization of these uh, 10 transitions uh, and we, we partitioned it into kind of a nutritious food uh, section, nature-based solution section, uh, and then wider choice and supply section and opportunities uh, overall. Uh, here on the nutritious food, uh, we looked at healthy diets. Uh, we'll shortly go a little bit into more detail. Uh, we also tried to do some modeling on the health, health consequences uh, of, uh, of better diets. Um, uh, not necessarily better diets for humans only, so it was really more a, an earth system uh, focus. Um, and then on the nature-based solutions, we looked uh, a lot into protection, but then also regenerative agriculture, and we also have a, a, an ocean component. Uh, then uh, on the, the wider choice, uh, we looked into kind of uh, resource efficiency, but also circular economy concepts. Uh, and then food uh, reduction of uh, food loss and waste, uh, and also, uh, which is a big topic, uh, diversifying protein supply. Because there are people thinking that we are into a phase of peak, peak protein. Uh, and then uh, supporting issues are digital revolution, uh, stronger rural livelihoods, where we actually looked at, uh, at, at the employment consequences, rural employment consequences of an enhanced uh, transition because most of it will actually trigger uh, uh, resource or production efficiencies uh, which will lay off quite a lot of people. And here we can easily talk about half a billion of people who would come onto the labor market uh, much earlier than, than expected. Like in many countries, like in this country, for example, the, the transition to the industrialization went very, very quickly. However, at that time, we had a, a demand pull from the industri industrial side. Uh, in, in, in our times, this demand is not that strong anymore. And then we also have a, a, a gender and demography issue there. Okay, uh, now I will go quickly into the detail of the scenarios that they get the feel on what were the, the discussions uh, behind uh, pinning down those scenarios. And the, the, overall arching, the overarching question was really, uh, is a better future actually possible? And what is possible? Uh, very shortly, this is uh, a, a visualization of the model uh, structure which we uh, developed and used, where we start with uh, geospatial information on the supply side, uh, uh, and then go all the way up to, to demand for food, fibers, energy, and we also added on uh, a, uh, an ocean component and the seafood component. And uh, we use a, a rather simple representation of the markets, uh, in order to be sufficiently transparent. Um, so what kind of assumptions did, uh, did we make? Uh, on uh, the policies related to climate mitigation, we have, uh, first of all, a current trend scenario where you see, for example, global energy demand increases by 52%, uh, and we have uh, biomass coming in uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite a bit, but... Uh, uh, these are the, the second generation biomasses. Um, and then in the better future, what we assumed was uh, this LED scenario, which I mentioned before. This is the uh, very resource efficient scenario uh, with uh, a lot of uh, 
uh, renewable energy in it. Uh, we have uh, high carbon prices. Uh, we don't use any bags, uh, and the bioenergy is really a, a small component in order to avoid competition for land uh, with the bioenergy sector. On the biodiversity side, uh, we basically, in the, in the current trend scenario, uh, there is no additional uh, conservation. And uh, here in the, in the better future one, uh, we actually assume that uh, certain high biodiverse uh, areas are actually spared from, uh, uh, from conversion. And we impose a subsidy payment uh, for restoration. On food security, we basically have a, a business as usual assumption and uh, in, in another assumption where we really try to feed everyone. Uh, we have uh, food loss and waste, where in the better future scenario, we were actually forced, we wanted to be way more aggressive, uh, but uh, industry more or less told us to assume only a 25% uh, reduction from current levels, so to say, uh, which was a surprise to me because uh, when I'm in Brussels and uh, we talk about uh, uh, the agriculture sector and climate mitigation, it's actually always the industry that says uh, uh, food loss and waste, a huge potential, but then uh, in the end it didn't. And uh, uh, there was quite some resistance here. Um, on, on the healthy diet, uh, we basically ended up the, uh, with uh, published scenarios of the Eat Lancet Commission. Uh, these are, uh, on the one hand, healthy diets for, for, for people, but also are quite uh, turned out to be very healthy for the planet as well. Um, then, uh, in terms of technological progress, uh, we overall the world expects up to 2050 yield increases in uh, livestock and uh, crop production of about 44%. Uh, and in this uh, scenario, in the better future scenario, we have 60, uh, 56%. Uh, we actually ended up uh, doing a f uh, biophysical study on the uh, feasibility and the 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 realism of this uh, scenario, and it actually looks like this is this is um, uh, actually not a more on a conservative side, I would say. Um, and, uh, and here we have then uh, on the afforestation, deforestation side, we impose uh, zero net deforestation already in 2020, which is uh, uh, given current conditions in quite a few countries, also in, in terms of political constellation, uh, not incredibly realistic. Um, and uh, on trade, uh, we ended up uh, only uh, not changing a lot. However, we, we changed a 50% tariff cut, cut for Sub-Saharan Africa. And on ocean proteins, I just want to point to you that uh, 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 bivalve agriculture is actually one of the, the technologies that came out as kind of a, a little bit of, a, for me, a, a surprise, uh, as, uh, as a huge resource for protein in the future. And the assumption we also made that uh, uh, meat is replaced by some of these, these proteins. So these are, these are then the, the results, which are uh, actually quite, uh, quite ambitious. So when you look at, uh, at deforestation, we have in the current trends 6.7 uh, 7 million hectares of deforestation uh, throughout uh, on average uh, uh, to 20, 2050. And here we almost eliminate uh, deforestation. Uh, what, uh, what's quite striking is uh, the development of agricultural land. So this is cropland and pasture land. Uh, we have uh, in the current trend scenario still an expansion of 400 million hectares, uh, uh, which is in the order of 50% uh, increase of, of current levels, uh, to a reduction in the order of 1.2 billion hectares. And we end up in the scenario to restore an additional 100 million hectares. So this is uh, the, the Earth from, uh, from the satellites uh, uh, would actually look radically different in, in these scenarios, if these scenarios were coming through. Uh, on the biodiversity, here you actually see there would be still a decline of 3.22%. Uh, and here we actually would observe a, a, a recovery. So this is what we call bending the curve. Uh, on food security, we basically eliminated uh, in this one uh, by additional supply. 
Uh, and uh, one other thing is, uh, since we, we eat less, so to say, uh, we also have uh, fewer deaths uh, uh, because of uh, a, uh, a more improved uh, uh, body mass index of uh, 5.6 million. And uh, the ocean economy is also improving quite a lot. So I'm, I'm really going very fast through these, uh, these uh, uh, results. Uh, they just tell you this is quite a radical scenario, and we actually solve uh, most of the problems, which is quite, uh, quite encouraging. Uh, one controversial issue which we always see is what happens to prices. And what's quite interesting is that, uh, so this is the difference from the current trend scenario. We, we see if we just do current trends and climate change mitigation, so if we do a single, single policy, so to say, we actually end up with higher crop prices uh, and uh, livestock prices or meat prices. However, if we implement all of those things, which I went through in quite big detail before, we actually see a reduction in prices, and especially uh, in terms of meat becomes much cheaper. Um, what's also quite interesting is how you can actually gain from, uh, rather than planning for a single uh, policy measure, by combining uh, policies. So what you see here is, uh, these are uh, the, the emissions in terms of gigaton CO2 per year uh, in, uh, in the year 2050. So we, we predict in the current trend scenario still uh, 12 gigatons of CO2. However, if we impose climate mitigation policy, we basically half it. However, if you put in addition a biodiversity policy in place, uh, and you, you impose uh, the Lancet, uh, Lancet diets, and you eliminate some of the uh, food loss and waste, and here the last one is uh, protein from the ocean, you actually end up with zero net emissions. So what this tells you, that a specific policy targeted to climate mitigation only delivers half of, uh, of what you could really gain. And so we really need to look at the, at the bundle, at the portfolio of uh, measures, uh, and uh, try to reap as much synergies as possible, rather than uh, looking at uh, policies individually. Uh, when we look at the biodiversity outcomes, it's even, even more, more uh, 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 it's even more so that uh, the, the synergies are, are playing out. So here you actually see the current trend scenario and just biodiversity protection. And biodiversity protection only uh, uh, helps you to, to stabilize, so to say. Uh, however, in, if you do the, the bundle of, uh, of uh, measures, uh, as uh, discussed before, you really can reverse uh, the, the trend in, bio, in terms of biodiversity. And we call this uh, bending the curve, bending the curve on biodiversity. So this is something we try to inject into the uh, negotiations on uh, biodiversity as uh, a potential target, where you could actually say, uh, by 2050, we should improve uh, the status of biodiversity over what we have today. This could uh, potentially qualify as a new target. However, uh, if uh, the, the, the work decides for massive bioenergy to do the uh, uh, negative emissions in 2040, this is where, we, where the, the world would go then in terms of biodiversity. So if, if, uh, if all in a sudden we need to change course, uh, on the climate mitigation side, let's say that uh, renewable energies and re energy efficiency uh, doesn't deliver, and we need to switch on biomass with carbon capture and sequestration, then of course you have a trade-off here. And you lose, uh, you lose the, the, uh, the, uh, the ambitious target on, on biodiversity. So here what really comes out is there is already today a very strong rationale to at least coordinate the UNFCC, the climate uh, negotiation process, with, uh, with the CBD. And this is not only in terms of negotiation process, but also in terms of uh, looking at uh, what countries propose to do. So what's, what's currently, for example, done is that uh, uh, in the climate negotiations, 
countries put forward uh, measures like afforestation, restoration, and they even produce maps. And uh, in 200 meters down the corner in the, in the Ministry of Environment, uh, uh, another group uh, delivers something to the Biodiversity Convention, and there is not necessarily an overlap. Huh? It's even, in some countries, it's, it's such that these guys never even talk to each other, huh? which is uh, amazing in a way, because in the end, we should actually come up uh, with one map, so to say, to de be delivered uh, uh, on, uh, on these things. And this is why we are proposing these uh, senatons. <laughs> And uh, where you actually have uh, country-led, or oh, I, I misspelled here, uh, uh, for the coordination of uh, multiple goals. And this is uh, something we do uh, within the Fable Consortium. Um, Charles is the representative for the uh, UK uh, in, within the uh, Fable Consortium. And we just uh, published now a report, Pathways to Sustainable Land Use and Food Systems, which you can download here. And uh, so what the objective of this uh, consortium is, is uh, that countries individually uh, come up with transition plans in the, in the land use sector. However, at the same time, uh, these country-led and also individual country exercises need to collectively meet global targets, the biodiversity target, the, the climate target. Because an individual country can plan for itself. However, uh, if it's uncoordinated with, uh, with another country, then there might be a lot of contradiction. And uh, so what, uh, what we did is we collected uh, 18 countries, including the European Union. Uh, uh, and what we are currently engaging on a lot, and this is this uh, last point here, is that we allow even for South-South learning. So in our case, the Brazilians are helping the uh, uh, Colombians and the Argentinians on the developing the tools and data gathering uh, to formulate then the, these new pathways. This is the representation of the countries that participate. Uh, of course, with this projection, we cheat a little bit because the North is larger than it really, it really is. Uh, and we have a huge gap here. And uh, this gap is already glaring for a long time because uh, the capacity in country is, uh, is unfortunately quite low, and once we build the, the capacity in these countries, the guys typically disappear because they get much better jobs than uh, being uh, researchers. So that's, that's a big issue. And uh, so what we are technically really doing is uh, we basically, currently we just work with an Excel sheet. Uh, we also have uh, uh, more richer models, and we populate it to begin with with the national data that is internationally available, mostly from the FAO. And then uh, we, we have this these calculator, uh, and countries come up uh, with uh, their, their plans. And then it goes into a linker tool, and then we see whether countries jointly actually deliver on global goals. There's also a verification tool I can probably go in later. So, uh, so how are we doing this, uh, this uh, Sinaton? Uh, it's... Uh, it's like this. So you have a model for country A, you have a model for country B, and there might be uh, bilateral coordination. So for example, uh, Brazil says, I have so much forest, I still want to chop down some, and I export soybeans to you. And uh, this country says, uh, yes, I, I have so little forest left, uh, I, and I don't want to chop it down, I import the, the soybeans from you. Uh, you can probably imagine which countries th those were now. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and so you have, uh, you have uh, a coordination in terms of target setting. In this case, uh, it would be uh, uh, the forest target. Uh, however, there is always trade inconsistency. And this, uh, this is where currently the linker comes in. Uh, but uh, this, is, uh, this is not the only thing. So the, the linker helps you to do the, the wipe out the, the trade inconsistency, but then we also have a dashboard, and then, see, then we see how these individual countries fare globally. 
when, they, when you combine the actions. And then, of course, in the first iteration, when countries pledged, so to say, uh, we will not reach the SDGs. So the SDG smiley will not smile. And uh, we have to tell the countries, be more ambitious, uh, go on, uh, till we actually reach the global targets. So this is an exercise we went through, through kind of virtual coordination, but also we had one meeting uh, in, in Germany where we actually had a, had a live discussion and we had, uh, we had uh, moderators here and you see here, for example, Austria, uh, Australia uh, pledged an increase in maize production to help other countries uh, to, uh, uh, to produce, uh, to conserve, uh, let's say, for less forest. Um, more forests. And here, uh, India uh, pledged to re reduce its, uh, its uh, milk imports. Um, this is then kind of a table of the assumptions, and I, I singled out the UK. And the UK was quite interesting, because uh, when you look, uh, you have a, a population increase assumed uh, of 20%. Uh, the meat consumption is reduced by 20%. There's not much happening on the trade. And uh, yield increases uh, are, are significant, but uh, probably not unrealistic. 40% up to 2050 and for crops and uh, uh, for livestock and for crops, 1.6. And you have forest 1.5 uh, million uh, hectares in the, in the country. This is also consistent uh, with some of the, the, the pledges that were really made also. Um, on the global level, we basically reached many targets. So we, we fed everyone. Uh, we have uh, zero net global deforestation. We also got for the land use sector uh, a net negative greenhouse gas budget. Uh, and we also did quite well on the biodiversity. What we didn't uh, achieve was uh, a greenhouse gas reduction goal in, in the agriculture sector. Um, just to give you an idea how this looks for an individual pledge, this is the forest pledge, and here you see that uh, deforestation is eliminated uh, over time. Uh, the red bars, so this here is actually the rest of the world. Uh, so the, the participating countries really delivered on zero net uh, uh, by 2030. And uh, you can also see then what are the contributions of the individual countries. And here, these kind of diagrams you can also use a little bit for blaming and shaming and get more mobilization uh, if certain countries uh, don't pledge enough. Uh, what we are planning now are uh, basically we really want to get into the, 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 the real pledging, so to say. So we have now agreements uh, with a few countries on uh, participation to actually do something for the uh, CBD COP in, in Beijing. No, it's actually in Kunming, uh, in, in China, uh, where a similar pledging exercise should be organized as we had it for the Paris Agreement. And uh, we are also trying to uh, ramp up uh, a uh, food and land use uh, action tracker. Good. Um, one issue which I, if time still allows, I could also stop here. Uh, what we find is, but this is not the firm finding yet, is, uh, and this is quite interesting, if we do this manual coordination, so if we just do bilateral coordinations between humans, uh, uh, and if countries become uh, sophisticated in their, in their negotiations, uh, within finite time you will not be able to organize a grand uh, transformation. And what we find through simulation results now is that we can actually use reinforcement learning algorithms to, so to say, nudge countries to go into the right, right direction and thereby be much faster. And, uh, uh, and now we are elaborating and we have, uh, we call this the Senaton Lab. Uh, we also try to, to massify and do individualized uh, synatons, uh, where we basically work with individuals and their, and their budgets and actually try to learn from individual experiment or experiments with individuals on how we could also uh, benefit uh, on bringing countries together. Uh, I have a few other slides. I will hopefully get some questions uh, on these lines, then I can show these, uh, these as well. But I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thanks, Michael, for a, a really fabulous talk covering so much. Um, what we will do is have 10 minutes or so of questions. Can I remind you that we are broadcast? So if you ask a question, do remember that. Uh, I should also welcome Philip Campbell, the editor in chief of Nature, who was. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Who would like to go first? Uh, Chris Dye at the back, and then a question there, Kay. Chris. Th thanks very much for your talk. Um, you, you said many things, as, uh, as Charles just repeated, but c can I ask you one general question, and that is, how do you handle uncertainty in general? You're dealing with mm -hmm. complex systems projected far into the future with many unknowns. Some of your results are clearly more robust mm -hmm. than others. H how do you handle that in general? How mm -hmm. do you sift the results that you can trust from the ones that you trust less? Yep. Um, Thank you for this question. I have two answers. Mm -hmm. One is uh, we had uh, and we still have ongoing workshops with the policy community exactly on this topic, whether or not we should flag the uncertainties and really be honest about the, the uncertainties, especially when it comes to, let's say, pledging uh, and, and these kind of things, which are really important for the policy process. And there, the policy guys always say, don't get into this. We want to have clear messages, no uncertainties. And uh, as, a, as a scientist, you, 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 you don't really like this. Uh, and uh, and it's, however, it's not accepted for the policy process. There are very few policy processes that ex accept uncertainties. And, uh, and especially when it comes to risk, like uh, the permafrost risk, for example, uh, they don't really want to hear this. And they're very honest. They say, we got so far now in the negotiations, don't bring this up. Uh, and don't bring these, these, uh, these, these issues up. This just messes up the, the, the negotiations. Uh, however, in, the, in, in our kind of research life, uh, we really need to take this uh, more serious. And they are, unfortunately, in the integrated assessment community, there are very few models that actually really do deep uh, assessment of the uncertainties, and there are very few who actually really work with risks. So if you, if you want to avoid or, uh, an uncertain risk like permafrost, you have a completely different uh, uh, control path in terms of emission trajectory than uh, as if you were living in a, in a certain world. And if you take this into account, and uh, with these uh, permafrost scenarios I, I showed to you, we're playing with these models. However, they're still in the kind of uh, academic, uh, scientific uh, domain. And we did not bridge over to the, to the policy domain. What's interesting also, and I stop then, uh, uh, with business people, the conversation is much easier. And they actually want to see the risks and the uncertainties. Thank you. Question there. Okay. Thank you very much for a very interesting um, talk and also an idea for a report I'm writing for the UNF triple C at the moment. So, oh. <laughs> very good. I was actually asking about the social implications of the, particularly the um, intent, well, not in, the improvements in productivity in agriculture. I've seen that usually associated with intensification of agriculture. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at that? Um, Yes, yes, we did. Yes, we did. Um, very quickly. So if uh, we, we did uh, before this even, just as, a, as an illustration, uh, uh, a calculation if you were to impose uh, the same productivity level as we have it in Europe to India and calculate how many people would be redundant, so to say, and affected. So not only the farmer, but also the, the dependent household. Uh, you could actually say that something like 500 million people would be directly affected by a massive shift towards uh, more mechanized uh, agriculture. So here we talk really very big numbers uh, and uh, a very big social transition. And there are very few countries who do this actually proactively. So China, for example, it's a centrally planned economy. Uh, they, they actually plan for this. Uh, however, in Africa or India, for example, uh, there are, there, there, you don't have the foresights. 
And uh, you also don't have the means to, to really organize this in a, in a proper fashion, as we did it in Europe. However, in Europe, we also had the safety valve. We exported 60 million people at that time to North America and South America. Uh, otherwise, we would also have had seen quite a lot of social unrest. And this is, this is something that is actually predictable. You know, we, 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 we know how many people there will be in 2050, more or less. And we know from historical experience that the agricultural transition can be quite fast. However, we don't prepare it. And there's also very little discussion. Thank you. Um, question in the front here, and then the woman with the blonde hair afterwards. Um, I note that you said that all scenarios assume steady economic growth. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested that you don't find it interesting to consider the possibility that growth is the problem. Mm. Uh, Could you comment on that? <laughs> uh, um, uh, here, uh, you actually need growth in order to finance the negative emissions. Because uh, uh, unless you use very cheap uh, negative emissions uh, to, to get out of it. Otherwise, you, don't even, you, you cannot finance uh, high technology like direct air capture to actually do it. Uh, I don't want to go to in, in the zero growth discussion because that's, that's a much larger picture. Uh, and I guess this was, however, your, your question. Uh, so let me avoid it, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question there. Hi. Um, so if the assumption is, is just expanding uh, intensive agriculture globally, am I right? And that's what you're saying for the yield calculations. Mm -hmm. um, how much work went into uh, sort of quantifying the, the side effects of that? So for example, Nitrogen fertilizer use is a big one. Did you just assume okay. perfect efficiency of that, or did you ignore the side effects that, that come with nitrogen fertilizer use? Okay, okay. Um, uh, we just got uh, uh, some review comments back of a paper to really go into this direction. Uh, and uh, what we did is uh, we used uh, the assumption of best observed yield in a certain region and calculated what we call a, a land sparing scenario so that we get shrinkage of, uh, of area and get the, the best uh, attainable yield with the result to replicate the food basket which we produced for 2015 that we would need only half of the cropland uh, uh, that is currently used. And what we see is that uh, you use about the same kind uh, amount of fertilizer, but even you would reduce a lot uh, irrigation water use and, uh, and many, many other co-benefits. Uh, however, this is a huge discussion, uh, uh, especially along, uh, and you're for sure familiar with uh, land sparing, land sharing. And we also did a land sharing scenario. And what we see there is that you almost have a trade-off with water use. However, you get, gain may, way more biodiversity. So these are things that uh, we can do now, and we have the data now to do this on a global level. Uh, however, these are early days, and we need to be much smarter. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to invite you to come on board. <laughs> there was a There's a lot to do. There. I should say, I'm going to go into about five past six, so another couple of questions that we started a little late. So when you get all the countries together um, to make these pledges, uh, is there, are they just pledging things until they get the answer, or is, is there kind of a constraint you make them think whether they actually can deliver what they're pledging? So, for instance, is it feasible for them to increase the intensification of agriculture? And if you're going to take people off the land, they're going to go into cities, and they're going to spend all day either being unemployed or in front of a computer which consumes carbon. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. do you put that feasibility in when you're having the discussions about the pledges? OK. Um, uh, there is one that is kind of technically checking of what they propose. And, uh, and here we used, for example, these uh, observed yields uh, and observed highest yields and sometimes even crop models. 
to, to say no to certain countries. However, we were quite generous on that one. Um, what we organized in order to get vetting for this individual scenarios for the, from the countries, uh, uh, we only partially did this yet, but in a few countries we actually put our modelers together with people who are on the policy recipient side and had a conversation and they, they actually, they asked them the nasty questions to their own modelers, uh, whether or not this is feasible or not. Huh? However, this is now more, still more of an academic exercise. Uh, however, with the joint pledging for the CBD and the UNFCC, where we work, we'll work with real policy processes, uh, exactly those things will, will come up. And then, of course, also it's not only the feasibility of it, but also the political will. And then things will look much darker, because here we went to all the targets and uh, everything is nice and dandy. Uh, then it will look much more what uh, I have shown at the earlier slides, where you have this deep, big discrepancy between what countries really pledge and what's necessary. And we will see this on biodiversity, on greenhouse gases, and many other dimensions. Just on the UK, then the pledges in the UK were what the Climate Change Committee is recommending government. And the Climate Change Committee is a statutory, statutory committee that has, has some role. A last question from Tim Palmer. Um, actually, I just wanted to come back to the question about uncertainty, because um, it strikes me your point about permafrost um, in the sense of being um, an irreversible process that... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, putting all the negative emissions at the end of your period will not uh, reverse is actually just one of many possible um, processes involving either the biosphere or the cryosphere or even potentially the oceans. Mm -hmm. um, and so it seems to me that, um, as you said, you know, bus business seems to be able to factor uncertainty into decision making in the sense that one can formulate a best decision when you have uncertainty. So it strikes me that these things shouldn't be somehow brushed to one side because they are quite central to the whole planning and incidentally this whole thing about reversibility has always strikes me as a, a reason why just purely thinking about cumulative emissions is, mm -hmm. is a dangerous um, sort of simplification. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I should be a little bit more precise on the uncertainty. I think uncertainty is accepted and probably welcome on setting the targets and the, the discussion of the targets, uh, especially 1.5 uh, and probably with what will go on. However, when it comes to these negotiations, uh, uncertainty is not wanted. And, uh, and uh, uh, I'm, we're struggling and we're trying to convince and we always try, but uh, it's not, not really accepted. And uh, we have, a, we have a game theoretic result where we show that if the uncertainty is large enough, uh, you can actually overcome the prisoner's dilemma. So uncertainty could actually be a means uh, towards coming quicker to compromises. Because if I know that I will benefit from climate change and you will, uh, you will suffer, I will not do anything. However, if we both are uncertain, then we might actually come closer to, to an agreement. So. Uh, I think there's probably a lot of education needed. And with business, those people are more educated on uncertainties, I would say, overall. And uh, policy people are not there yet. Thank you. Just before closing, can I point out that uh, next week, the 31st, uh, we have the next lecture in this series, Linking People, Nature, Food, and Climate, Pro Progress and Implications. And it's by David Nabarro, who was the UN Special Rapporteur for food security, and has had a host of other positions mm -hmm. in the UN network. So that's going to be really fascinating. And then you'll see outside uh, an advertisement for these six talks in this series. But let me finish there and thank Mikael for a hugely challenging talk that was both fascinating and worrying. Thank you.